Welcome back everyone to a new classroom called College of Glycation. I am Paul Reynolds, a biomedical scientist and professor of cell biology. This is a classroom where you can learn about the latest information in the areas of glycation, inflammation, and overall health. Last week, we covered glycation 101, the basics of glycation. Today, we're diving into a topic that's at the heart of so many health conversations, yet it's often misunderstood. The topic is inflammation. If you've ever sprained an ankle, battled a cold, or wondered why chronic diseases like diabetes or heart disease are so rampant, inflammation is the common thread. Today, we're going back to the basics, call it Inflammation 101. We'll unpack what inflammation is, why it's both a hero and a villain in your body, the differences between acute and chronic inflammation, what's driving inflammation in our modern world, and how we can tame it with science-backed strategies. And yes, we will talk about carbohydrates, ketosis, and the big chronic diseases tied to runaway inflammation. Before we get into the basics, let's first take a quick historical detour. Inflammation has been around forever. Our ancestors relied on it to fend off infections and predators. The Romans got the ball rolling. In the first century, a fellow by the name of Celsus jotted down the four main signs, redness, swelling, heat, and pain. But it wasn't until the 19th century that scientists like Rudolf Virchow linked inflammation to disease. By the 20th century, scientists like Eli Metnikoff were linking inflammation to immunity, earning Nobel Prizes along the way. Chronic inflammation is exploding. A 2019 analysis in the journal called The Lancet pegged inflammatory diseases as behind over 60% of global deaths. Why? Well, our world has changed. We've gone from hunting and gathering to Uber Eats and Netflix binges. Sugar intake is up, movement is down, and stress is through the roof. Inflammation is no longer just a survival tool, it's a modern plague. So let's begin with the basics. What is inflammation? At its core, inflammation is your body's response to a threat. Think of it as your immune system's alarm system. When something goes wrong, say you cut your finger, you get a virus, or even stub your toe, your body sends out immune cells and chemicals and blood flow to that scene in order to fix the problem. It's like a fire department rushing to put out a blaze. The classic signs, yes, the same, redness, heat, swelling, and pain. Those are your body's firefighters at work. But here's the kicker. Inflammation isn't just about cuts or bruises. It's in fact a complex process involving cells, signaling molecules, and even blood vessels. Scientists have broken it down into key steps, and I'll walk you through them briefly. First, there's a trigger. It could be an injury, an infection, or even a toxin. Your immune cells, like macrophages, detect the problem and release signaling molecules called cytokines. These cytokines, like interleukin-6 or TNF-alpha, act like megaphones. And in fact, what they do is they call in more immune cells to the scene. Blood vessels open up, letting in those immune cells, which causes the swelling and redness. Finally, the immune system neutralizes the threat and repair begins. This process has been studied extensively, first in cell cultures. For example, 15 years ago in 2010, there was a study in the Journal of Immunology. And what they did was they used human macrophage cell lines to show how cytokines like IL-1 beta amplify inflammation by activating a pathway controlled by NF-kappa B. That's a molecule that's kind of like a master switch for inflammation. And what NF-kappa-B does is it turns on the genes that produce even more inflammatory signals. Human studies back this up. In 1999, there was a study in circulation that measured cytokine levels in patients with infections. And they found there was elevated IL-6 and TNF-alpha, 
two important inflammatory cytokines, and they've confirmed, therefore, that these molecules drive inflammatory responses in real people. Now, you might be thinking, this sounds intense. Why is inflammation, therefore, a good thing? Well, that's a great question. Acute inflammation, that's the short-term kind of inflammation, is your body's superpower. Without it, you'd be in big trouble. Imagine you get a splinter. Acute inflammation sends immune cells to kill any bacteria, clear any debris, and start healing. A 2008 study in Nature Reviews Immunology showed that in cell cultures, neutrophils, those are key immune cells, rapidly engulf bacteria during acute inflammation, preventing infection over the long term. In humans, this is why a small cut heals in days, not weeks. A 2014 study, again in the same journal called The Lancet, they tracked patients with minor injuries and found that acute inflammatory markers peaked within 24 hours, just a day later, and then they dropped as healing progressed. That is inflammation doing its job. Acute inflammation is like a well-trained fire crew. They show up, they put out the fire, and then they're gone by dinner time. It's precise, it's controlled, and temporary. But here's where things get dicey. Not all inflammation is acute. So let's contrast acute inflammation with its troublesome cousin, chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation is like a fire that never gets put out. It smolders. It damages healthy tissue over time. Unlike acute inflammation, which resolves quickly, chronic inflammation lingers for months or years. It tends to be driven by persistent triggers like poor diet, stress, or even autoimmune conditions. The same cytokines like IL-6 and TNF-alpha we've spoken about already help in acute inflammation. They, in this case, become villains constantly signaling and causing collateral damage. Cell culture studies show this clearly as well. In 2013, there was a study in the journal called PLUS One, where the researchers exposed human endothelial cells, those are the cells that line your blood vessels, to chronic low levels of TNF-alpha. The result? Well, the cells became dysfunctional. They promoted atherosclerosis or the buildup of plaques in arteries. Human studies echo this. In 2004, there was a study in the New England Journal of Medicine, and they followed patients with chronic inflammation. They measured that by looking at a molecule called C-reactive protein, or CRP. That is a molecule found um, abundantly in, in individuals that have rampant chronic systemic inflammation. They found that there was a higher risk of heart attacks when CRP levels or chronic inflammation was apparent. Now, chronic inflammation, unfortunately, doesn't just stay local. It can spread systemically, affecting your entire body. So what's fueling this chronic inflammation epidemic? Let's talk first off about lifestyle and diet, because this is where things get real. First, let's address the elephant in the room, our modern diet. High carbohydrate intake, especially refined carbs and sugars, is a major driver. When you eat a bagel or you drink a soda, your blood sugar spikes, triggering insulin release, but it also sparks inflammation. That was shown in a 2005 study in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology in which they took cell cultures, exposed them to high glucose levels, and yes, lo and behold, NF-kappa-B activity increased, ramping up cytokine production and inflammation. In humans, a study in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, published in 2010, found that people eating high glycemic diets had higher CRP levels. Again, that's the marker of systemic inflammation. So the trend is clear. The more we've leaned into processed, heavy sugar diets, the more inflammation we will experience. And the data backs this up. Over the last century, sugar consumption has skyrocketed. In 1900, the average American ate about five pounds of sugar a year. Today, it's closer to 130 pounds annually. 
That's a 26-fold increase, and our cells, I promise you, are paying the price. Let's talk about seed oils like soybean or corn oil. They are other culprits. These are rich in omega-6 fatty acids, which in excess promote inflammation. A 2006 study in the journal Lipids showed that omega-6 fatty acids in cell cultures increased prostaglandin E2. That's an inflammatory molecule. Human studies, like one from the Journal of Nutrition in 2018, found that diets high in omega-6 correlate with higher IL-6 levels or inflammatory cytokine abundance. Now, beyond diet, lifestyle factors like stress, poor sleep, and inactivity also play a role. In 2012, there was a study in brain behavior and immuni immunity showing that chronic stress in humans raised IL-6 and other cytokines, mimicking the effects seen in cell, cell culture models. Sitting all day doesn't help, right? In 2017, a study in medicine, science, and sports exercise linked sedentary behavior to higher inflammatory markers. So let's now zoom in on carbohydrates and a powerful tool to combat inflammation, and that's ketosis. High carb diets, as we've seen, drive inflammation through blood sugar spikes and insulin surges. But what if we flip the script? By reducing carbs and entering ketosis, where your body then burns fat for fuel, you can dial down inflammation. How is that? Well, ketones, like beta-hydroxybutyrate, have anti-inflammatory effects. There was a study in 2015 in Nature Medicine that showed that in cell cultures, beta-hydroxybutyrate inhibited the inflammasome. That's a complex of many proteins that trigger cytokine release. In humans, a paper in the Journal of Clinical Investigation found that ketogenic diets lowered IL-1 beta and other inflammatory markers in people especially noted to have obesity. Now, ketosis isn't just about cutting carbohydrates. It's about shifting your metabolism to a state where inflammation is naturally suppressed. It's like turning down the heat on a smoldering fire. But ketosis isn't the only tool. We'll get to more in a moment. Before we talk solutions, let's connect chronic inflammation to the big chronic diseases, diseases you've undoubtedly heard of, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's, and even cancer. All of these disorders have inflammation as a central player. Take heart disease, for instance. Chronic inflammation damages blood vessels, promoting plaque buildup. There was a study about 20 years ago in the journal Circulation showing that high levels of CRP predicted heart attack risk in humans. In diabetic situations, inflammation impairs insulin signaling. A study in the journal Diabetes found that IL-6 and TNF-alpha, the same cytokines we've been talking about throughout this classroom, disrupt insulin pathways in cell cultures and human studies alike. What about Alzheimer's disease? This is a case of notable inflammation in the brain or neuroinflammation. It is driven by cytokines, accelerating neurodegeneration along the way. Let's cover cancer. As was mentioned, cancer also is a chronic inflammatory promotion of cell mutations. In 2014, a study in Cell showed how inflammatory signals drive tumor growth in a host of different cell models. These diseases aren't just random. They are in fact tied to that smoldering fire of chronic inflammation. So how do we put it out? Well, these are some science-based ways to limit inflammation. These are solutions grounded in evidence. First off is diet. We've already touched on cutting refined carbs and embracing ketosis, but it is in fact broader than that. A Mediterranean-style diet rich in vegetables, fish, olive oil, and nuts has robust anti-inflammatory effects. 
a study published in 2013 in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition showed that Mediterranean diets lowered CRP levels and IL-6 in humans. So let's talk next about some cell culture studies, like the one from Journal of Nutritional Biochemistry. This was 15 years ago in 2010, but they found that omega-3 fatty acids from fish oil reduced cytokine production as well. Next, let's talk about exercise or movement. Physical activity is a potent anti-inflammatory. In 2017, there was a study in brain behavior and immunity. It showed that 30 minutes of daily exercise cuts inflammation. In fact, exercise reduced NF-kappa B activity in muscle cells and other cells in the body. In humans, there was a study that found that chronic or rather regular aerobic exercise lowered CRP in sedentary adults. Even moderate movement like walking will help. Let's talk about sleep and stress management because they too are critical. In 2015, there was a study in the journal Sleep that showed sleep deprivation increases IL-6 cytokine secretion in humans, while cell studies confirm that stress hormones just like cortisol can amplify inflammation. There's a great connection here between the stress hormone cortisol and inflammation. Both feed off one another, and the more you mitigate inflammation, the lower your levels of stress hormone like cortisol will be, and the more active you will have sleep. Practices like mindfulness or yoga can also help. Let's all chill out. Meditation lowers stress markers, and mindfulness or quiet reflective time shifts you from a more relaxing parasympathetic state as opposed to the more inflammatory sympathetic fight or flight state. These aren't just theories. They are, in fact, excellent tools. So there you have it. Inflammation 101. It's your body's fire department. Essential for fighting threats, but dangerous when it burns out of control. Acute inflammation will save you. Chronic inflammation will harm you. Our modern diet, stress, and inactivity fan the flames, but we can fight back with low-carb diets, ketosis, exercise, sleep, and stress management. The science is clear. From cell cultures to human trials, inflammation isn't just a buzzword. It is a key to understanding health and disease. Thanks so much for joining me today. I'll see you next time. Stay sharp and stay healthy.